now we've got common problems. I'm Dave Walsworth from Michigan State. And you can think of common problems as the potpourri of stuff that didn't really fit anywhere else. So it all got stuck here. So everybody make sure you've got your gear shift out for your brains and let's go. All right. So the big news on common problems is that they make up about half of the visits that you see. And does that feel about right for everybody in the audience? You know, you see the common things pretty commonly. About half of them have to do with pain somewhere, some type. About a third are upper respiratory. About another quarter are non-pain, non-respiratory, everything else. And sometimes they're easy and sometimes they're not. But the good news is about a third of the time they get better on their own, regardless of what we do or don't do. About a third are somatic that can be medically managed. And there's a whole list of them there. So AAFP came out with a list of five things not to do. And they came out with this list because they're things that are commonly done every day in practice, but they don't add value. They don't improve outcomes. They may or may not cost a lot or have bad side effects that can happen as a result, but they're things that we probably don't need to be doing. They don't add. And one of the first is imaging for low back pain. Unless there's a red flag, unless you think that there's an infection, there's a cancer, there's a neurologic emergency or urgency, they don't add to your benefit. You're going to do the same things. You're going to treat them conservatively. Most back pain gets better on its own in six weeks. Some doesn't. But if there's red flags, then imaging may make all the difference in the world. Routine antibiotic prescriptions. If you really think it's a virus, describe the course that it'll probably take to your patients. If it varies from that course, reassess. But the antibiotics aren't going to help a virus. And we heard a great lecture yesterday that there's quite a bit of C. diff on the rise. That's from antibiotic overuse. And I don't usually let an antibiotic strip out unless I talk to them about probiotics or at least yogurt with active cultures to try to cut down on the diarrhea and yeast infections. And that can save about 5.8 billion annually. Dual x-ray absorptiometry or DEXA scanning for osteoporosis. For women under 65 and men under 70 without risk factors, it's probably not going to get you anywhere. And if you Google FRAX, you'll get to the FRAX site at Sheffield, University of Sheffield, which is a British site, but you can actually calculate the risk for your patient to have osteoporosis based on her current risk factors. And the recommendation currently, at least in Michigan, from our Michigan Quality Improvement Consortium, or MQIC, is if the risk of osteoporosis is less than the risk of a 65-year-old with no other risk factors, or 9.3% in 10 years, don't do the study. Still use preventive care, still treat with calcium, vitamin D, weight-bearing exercise, look for symptoms, but the study itself probably not going to be terribly beneficial. And U.S. Preventive Services Task Force came out with the same thing, as well as insufficient evidence for or against screening in men, period. Annual ECGs in asymptomatic individuals or any other routine cardiac screening in folks who don't have risk factors for disease, very little evidence that they improve anything. And the false positives create harm because every abnormal study gets followed up with another study. And we've seen it especially with radiographic things where the incidentaloma leads to another study, leads to another study, leads to another study. It doesn't really go anywhere. But by the time you're done, you've spent a lot of money and potentially exposed them to a lot of radiation that may not have been necessary in the first place. Pap smears. We just had a great lecture on this. Don't do them under 21 
or if you've got a woman who's had a hysterectomy for non-cancer reasons. And when you do them, if it's normal, every three years. And there's increasing support for every five years depending on HPV DNA. Stay tuned because this is going to be a changing area over the next decade. And I am willing to bet it's going to look a lot different in 10 years than it looks right now. And it sure looks a lot different today than it did 10 years ago. The beauty of evidence-based medicine is also its curse. It's always changing. And sometimes it does 180s when you least expect it. Let's talk about obesity again. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. The body mass index is calculated by the weight in kilos divided by the height in meters squared. So your units are kilograms per meter square. In adults, if your BMI is over 25, you're considered overweight. Over 30, obese, and over 40, extremely obese is the nice term. We usually know it more, and ICD-9 knows it as morbidly obese. The treatment includes diet and exercise. And for, for quality measures, it's important to document specifically what type of diet recommendations you made, what type of exercise recommendations you made. Because that's a quality measure if you're doing PQRS for Medicare. And there's G codes that relate to it. You can also end up doing surgery and other treatments. You can see the section on the dietary guidelines and the community medicine for a lot more detail on the diet. But basically, it comes down to calories in versus calories out or calories in versus METs out. And what are you doing? And most of the time we're taking a lot more calories in than we're putting out because it doesn't take a lot to sit in lecture. Mine's working a whole lot, body not so much. Okay. It's important to do this in the kids because it builds a lifelong change. And hopefully we'll see it less in the adults, but we have to work with the adults as well to decrease their risk factors. And it's targeted more at fitness than sports and at things that they enjoy and trying to find those things so that they actually do them so it becomes fun and not work. An adult can lose one to two pounds a week by simply eating 500 to 1,000 calories less per day. Okay, that may be a Big Mac when you think about it because I think that thing's be about 900 calories. And it can be that simple. And the only way to lose weight is to expend more energy than you take in. But it's hard. And the short-term results, we see improvement. But long-standing, long-term results, we often see a return to baseline within one to two years with dietary treatment. For years and years and decades, we've tried different drugs. Stimulants, antidepressants. Short-term studies show that they help. Long-term studies, not so much. And they're not always the safest things in the world. The stimulants increase heart rate and blood pressure. Some of the medications give dry mouth, nervousness, insomnia, or can easily be abused because people kind of like how they feel because all of a sudden they've got more energy than the cup of coffee gave them. Okay, The norepi and serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Meridia were actually pulled in 2010 due to cardiac risk and some of the valvular heart disease that was showing up because of it. There's a new drug on the market. We'll see how it goes. It's another serotonin receptor, now an agonist, called Lorcaserin. It's a 2C, so it's a novel serotonin reuptake inhibitor or agonist. And it can promise three to four kilos for up to two years as far as weight loss. Not a whole heck of a lot. It was just approved. Other beneficial effects, slight but significant decreases in blood pressure, heart rate, total and LDL cholesterol, fasting glucose and insulin levels. More than you would expect just from the weight loss alone. So we'll see how this one does. Anybody remember Orlistat or Xenical? Okay, in residency we used to joke if you write that you have to write for the Depends as well because what happens is not pretty, and that's how it reinforces the behavior, because you don't want that happening. It does have a durable weight loss of about two and a half 
kilograms more weight loss than placebo. It's now available over the counter in half strength. And there was some evidence that it decreased cholesterol as well. The diabetes drugs can be useful, the metformin, the premlinotide, and the liraglutide. So think about the portion distortion, okay? When you think about pretzels, we'll go off the slide here for a moment. That pretzel yesterday, was that one serving? Probably not. You know, when you look at the pastries and the bagels, you know, these bagels that are about this big, that's actually four servings. And when you get these really good portions, everyone likes the restaurants that have really good portions because you get your value, yeah, you get something else too. Okay? You know, that bagel 20 years ago was 140 calories. Nowadays, it's 350. So surgical treatment for obesity is certainly an option. It's usually reserved for the extremely obese, those with a BMI over 40 or with a BMI 35 with at least one or more medical complications. And the idea is to induce malabsorption. Take away the absorptive area so that you can't absorb nutrients. Or leave such a small portion of stomach that you can only eat, some people would say like a bird, but that wouldn't be good because birds eat more than their weight each day. Um, but you can only eat small amounts. And the Ruin Y gastric bypass is probably the king of the anti-obesity surgeries. Now everyone's playing king of the mountain and bringing other surgeries forward. We'll see how they do. But in this one, they leave, the stomach is only 20 to 30 cc's in size. That's all that's left of the stomach. And they leave that portion of stomach from a non-distensible portion of the stomach. So it's literally the size of a grape, okay? Everything else is closed off, cut off, and then taken out of the loop, if you will. You lose all the way, including the first 15 to 20 centimeters of the jejunum. So you can imagine that you're not going to be able to absorb nutrients nearly as well. And in fact, 65 to 70 percent mean excess weight loss. The difference between what they should weigh versus what they did weigh preoperatively is the durable weight loss that is persistent at more than five years. There's a perioperative mortality of less than 1%. And when you think about the risk factors that these people bring to the table for this surgery, that's really pretty good. You have to supplement multiple vitamins and other nutrients, iron, calcium, all the fat-soluble vitamins, folate, biotin, selenium, zinc, copper. Vitamin C deficiencies are common. And you can, the biggest risk is the dumping syndrome. If they eat too much, especially carbohydrate or pure sugar, or have solids with liquids, they can get a dumping syndrome with nausea, bloating, colic, and diarrhea because of rapid gastric emptying because there's, it's only the size of a grape. There we go. The vertical band gastroplasty is less of an invasive procedure. Staples are used to create a portion of the stomach that's 15 or 20 mils in size. The durable weight loss is about 60% of the excess weight. But almost one in five have to be reoperated on later because of outlet stenosis or severe reflux. So it's not done much. Gastric banding, that's the one where you put the device in and there's a band that you fill with saline to restrict the top portion of the stomach. Least efficacious, 30 to 50 percent durable, mean excess weight loss, and reoperation rates of 20 percent. They slide, they get out of place, the reservoirs can be damaged. There's the bilio pancreatic bypass with duodenal switch, which is similar but not quite as extreme as the Ruin Y. And then the newest kid on the block is the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. This procedure originally started out in life as a staged procedure for the super morbid, BMIs 60 and above, multiple risk factors, coronary artery disease, diabetes, surgical nightmare patients, because you can get in and get out relatively quickly, 
and there's some, there's significant weight loss, and what they're finding is the weight loss seems to be durable, similar to Ruin Y, but originally it was staged to get the risk down to the point where you could do the Ruin Y. So the landscape here is changing as well, stay tuned. Not all plans cover the sleeve gastrectomy, not all plans cover anti-obesity surgery. So you need to know what your patients are bringing to the table with them. Here are the long-term nutritional defic yeah, deficiencies following bariatric surgery and the recommended supplementation. There's a lot of supplementation that has to take place because they don't absorb. Iron, calcium, vitamin D, B12, all the fat-soluble vitamins, thiamine. So you're going to look at biochemical markers during the first year every three to six months and annually thereafter to make sure they're not getting anemic from the folate and the iron that's not being absorbed. The electrolytes to make sure that the dumping syndrome isn't getting out of control. The glucose, because you may be able to step down. In fact, there's some evidence that a ruin Y can cure, quote unquote, diabetes, at least short term. Liver profiles, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone. So what are the complications? One of the biggest ones is vomiting. You can imagine if you only have a stomach the size of a grape, if you eat like you used to, that's not going to work. And in fact, one of the complications can also be that the lower portion of the esophagus gets recruited as a pouch to feed that grape slowly over time. The persistent vomiting or intolerance of solid food at least up to six months due to stomach stenosis that can also happen. And then the dumping syndrome. That's why they usually eat and drink but not at the same time. They'll drink before or after, they'll eat before or after but not at the same time. It's too much volume for that grape to handle. Other complications, it increases the risk for gallstones. Drug absorption rates are changed significantly. So everything that they're taking has to be redosed based on efficacy. The skin doesn't usually just go away. By the time most of these people have this surgery, or if there's significant weight loss after a certain age, the skin is pretty loose and just kind of hangs. And of course that can lead to irritation, infections, and occasionally that has to be removed surgically so that it doesn't happen. And then postprandial hypoglycemia is a significant risk because the pancreas is still used to putting out the same amount of insulin that it's had to put out until it slowly gets down regulated after the procedure. Bariatric surgery is called behavior management surgery because that's what it is. The side effects are so bad you can't do what you used to do previously. Slow eating, small portions. I don't know many physicians that eat slowly or in small portions because they usually don't take time to eat. Chewing well with every single bite. Stopping at a given point until you learn to recognize what full feels like and then when full separating fluids from solids for at least an hour and no NSAIDs. In fact, a lot of medications have to be given as a liquid because they absorb better in what's left of that stomach. So let's go to the other side of the equation. We talked about obesity. The other side is the unexplained weight loss. And it's defined as 5% of the body weight over a 6 to 12 month period without trying. 10 pounds over a three month period is also a good definition. And you need to differentiate anorexia or not being hungry from weight loss with normal intake. And the reason is, this is when you start your cancer witch hunts because that's one of the biggest reasons for unexplained weight loss is an unfound occult cancer. So you'll check colon, you'll check breast, you'll check pap and ovaries you look at the skin. 
A subset of this is weight loss in the elderly, and this is actually really common. Social issues seem to be behind a lot of it. Loose-fitting dentures. If it hurts to eat, you don't generally eat. If you can only afford your food or your medicine, you make choices. And oftentimes, you don't get enough of either. And cancer is more common as we age. So the nine Ds of weight loss in the elderly, the nine things to check. Dentition. Do they have teeth? Do they fit if they're not their own? Dysgeusia. Does it hurt when they eat and swallow? Dysphagia. Chronic disease. Is something uncontrolled? Are these side effects for multiple medications? Depression. Do they just not want to get up and get going and do stuff? Do they just sit around and not eat? Because they're not really hungry, they're not doing much. Do they have diarrhea where they're eating normally but their nutrients are going out the back end? Are they demented so they don't even think about eating? Do they have other dysfunctions and other drugs? So insomnia, this is everybody's favorite diagnosis, right? Everybody just loves insomnia. For me, it's right behind fatigue. You know, the differential is wide and, and it's just huge. So insomnia is actually defined as either difficulty initiating sleep, that's early insomnia, difficulty maintaining sleep, that's mid-insomnia, or early arising, that's late insomnia. And it's one of the most common complaints that we have. Poor sleep hygiene accounts for 1 in 10. Psychiatric disorders, about a third. Drug and alcohol use, about 1 in 10, 12%. Restless leg syndrome is actually a lot more common than you'd think. Unless you actually notice it and diagnose it, then you know how common it is. About 1 in 10. Primary insomnia, no other reason, can't find a secondary cause, one in, about 15%. And sleep apnea, not as common as you'd think, about 6%. So of course, like everything else, we try to ferret out the underlying cause and treat the underlying cause and keep treating the underlying causes we find until we come down to idiopathic. Here's my favorite diagnosis, fatigue kind of the bane of our existence because everybody's fatigued. You guys are fatigued, <laughs> okay? We're fatigued. <laughs> These are long days. It's a sense of exhaustion during or after usual activities. Okay, you guys aren't fatigued. This isn't what you do every single day. You don't try to drink from the fire hydrant every single day, okay? Categories recent, less than a month, prolonged more than a month, chronic more than six months. Five to eight percent of the patients are going to have fatigue. And here's the list of causes. There are many, and they're esteemed. Psychological depression, anxiety, somatization. Almost every psychologic diagnosis could theoretically be here. Fatigue is a real protean symptom. Pharmacologic, a lot of the medications that we give people make them tired. You know, how often do you write a beta blocker? How often do you look at the side effects and fatigue is listed for darn near everything? Fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, rash. Pretty much anything you put in your mouth can cause all of those things. It's kind of like the seasons in Michigan. We get all of them in one day, very often. Endocrine and metabolic. Thyroid's a big one. You know, that's your energy center. If the energy center isn't working right, it's not going to be right. Diabetes, like slogging through maple syrup because that's what your blood can be like if it's uncontrolled. Hepatic and renal issues. If you're building up toxins that you can't get rid of, you're going to be fatigued. And then anemia. If you don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity, you're going to be fatigued. Cancer. Have you noticed that cancer's in just about every differential? Eh. Infectious, and it's not just all mono, but all kinds of infections can happen chronic fungal infections, chronic bacterial infections, CHF and COPD, disturbed sleep because you're not getting enough sleep, and this is where your sleep apnea, restless legs, etc., come in, 
And then the final one, idiopathic versus chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue has a definition. Idiopathic, are you guys familiar with the definition of idiopathic? The funny one? The funny one says that the patient is pathetic and the physician is an idiot? No, it really means we can't find a reason despite our best efforts to look. But sometimes it's fun to lighten things up. Again, history, probably more so than physical exam, extremely important. Open-ended questions. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Tell me more about. Physical exam on things that come out of the history. Labs. Blood count, sed rate, comp panel, TSH, TB skin test, HIV testing. HIV is probably the new syphilis as far as being able to mimic just about everything. Maybe RPR should be on there. Cancer witch hunt. If you can find a cause, treat it. Peel it like an onion, get down through the layers, and hopefully you'll be able to make a difference for this person. One of the biggest things is the relationship that you have with them and building up that therapeutic alliance so that they know that you're listening, you care, and you're trying. Because this is a very trying thing. They feel crappy and they don't know why. And they worry that it's something bad. A healthy lifestyle, keeping up with work and play, trying to be as much of a person as they can be despite feeling like they're dragging themselves through. Avoid oversleeping or inappropriate sleeping because messing up the sleep cycle even further is not going to help. You might try a trial of an antidepressant even if they don't appear to be overtly depressed because sometimes it helps. That's later layer as you peel your way down. Versus cognitive behavioral therapy, more if you actually think you find depression. So chronic fatigue. This one has a true definition. It's, unco it's an uncommon cause of chronic fatigue that lasts more than six months. It's unexplained, persistent, or relapsing fatigue not alleviated by rest that results in occupational, social, or educational problems and four or more of the following. And without four, it doesn't fit the bill for chronic fatigue syndrome, even though everyone wants it to be. But they shouldn't if they really think about it. Memory impairment, sore throat, tender nodes, muscle pain, arthralgia, headaches, unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise, Let's flip over to dyspnea. Doc, I can't breathe, I'm short of breath. There's another diagnosis that has a lot of potential causes. Associated more with increased work of breathing than actual hypoxia, because they're working harder, but they're actually able usually to use their reserves effectively and maintain their pulse ox. They usually can't really describe it or quantitate it, they just Air hunger is a great term. They just feel like they can't get a good breath. Respiratory, if you're not able to exchange oxygen, that could be part of the problem. Asthma, pneumonia, pneumothorax. If you've got part of your lung collapsed because you've got a big air bubble in there, it doesn't work real well. Pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure. Chronic respiratory, like COPD, interstitial lung disease, pleural effusion, all the pneumoconioses, congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathies, obesity, or is it a problem with the pumping action? Are the diaphragms not working so they're not pulling down and helping to expand the lungs? Is there a neuromuscular problem that's driving it? What's your workup? Well, let's take a look at the stuff that's there. Get your chest x-ray, see what it looks like. If it's hyperinflated, that tells you one thing. 
If you've got one diaphragm up, one diaphragm down, that tells you something else. If you've got a ground glass appearance, chances are you're not seeing that in the office, but that tells you something different. Spirometry. How many, how many of you guys do spirometry in the office? Yeah. It's pretty quick, it's pretty easy, and it's pretty useful as long as you make sure you're getting acceptable tests and reproducible tests because you can't sandbag your way to normal, but you can sandbag your way to abnormal. So you got to make sure it's a good effort. VQ scans and spiral CTs in the right patient could be very useful. If you think that they've got a chronic indolent, if they're throwing clots, it's a good test. An echocardiogram, how, what, what's the squeeze like? If you don't have echocardiogram, the older one is MUGA testing. But if you're not squeezing, that's a good sign. Thyroid function, because that affects cardiac and respiratory function. Blood count, if you're anemic, especially extremely anemic. Doesn't matter how well you squeeze or how well you air exchange, you don't have enough substrate to move the air around. And then stress testing, do you have ischemia? Like everything else we've talked about and will talk about in this section, if you can find the underlying cause, treat it. Peel it like an onion. Sometimes you get to one level and you get one thing a little bit better under control. It's not quite enough. Keep going. In severe cases, oxygen may help. Okay. Anti-anxiety medications may help, but again, try to keep them for emergencies only. It's probably not something you want to use on a daily basis unless they're so moribund that you're not concerned with the habit-forming nature. And there's a time and place for that, too. The long-acting anti-anxiety medication, buspirone, may be useful if anxiety is a piece of it. You know, that's as close to a controller med as we have for anxiety. Morphine or other opioids in the right situation can actually be helpful and decrease the work of breathing. But again, you have to be pretty moribund to use those long term. So approaching the patient with chronic shortness of breath. Most of them you're going to have something that you can lock on to and try to treat and see how it goes and dig your way through. And use some of the symptoms that go along with it. If the chest is tight, well think cardiac, but also think asthma. If they can't get a good breath, that is more associated with obstructive lung disease, especially if they can't get the air out. Shallow, rapid breathing because they can't expand with the interstitial lung diseases because they've lost their compliance. Air hunger with myocardial and dysfunction and CHF. Deconditioning with heavy breathing despite relatively limited activity. Use your clues. Use your workup. We've already talked about this. BNP may also be useful if you're looking at CHF.